Case Customer Creations is sponsored by Bits and Bits. Use the code JBates to save 10% off your next router bit or CNC bit purchase at bitsbits.com. This is a pretty fun project that I just completed, and it is a cooler cart uh, for drinks, for entertaining. We've got a, a nice outdoor kitchen that we've built over the past couple of years, and this is going to be a welcomed addition to it. So inside here is just a big cooler. Need a little oil on that hinge. It's a big cooler. Yep, oil. Oil is necessary there. Uh, it's a big, big cooler box. And if you're interested, I have a set of plans available to make one of these. These plans are made for people who don't have a CNC machine. So this is uh, everything you need to make one of these with typical modern woodworking tools. So either a circular saw or a table saw, a jigsaw or a bandsaw, uh, a router table or a router. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can use those, excuse me, to make this entire project. But I'm lazy and I have a CNC machine, so that's what I use to cut mine out. So included with these plans is also the CNC files. If you happen to have access to a CNC machine, uh, or if you have one or can go get the pieces cut and bring it home, that might be a convenience to you. So included are those as well. Uh, so plans available if you're interested. We'll talk more about that later. I've got a little outline to follow here about the design, the cutting of the material, optional decoration before assembly, and of course assembly. So let's jump into the design. An obvious design element is mobility. This is on casters so you can roll it around on a hard surface. If you want to roll this around on grass or something like that, I would suggest at least a four inch caster. These are two inch casters. Now that's the size of the wheel, not the entire assembly. So this two inch caster added two and three quarters of an inch in height. Down below is what I'm calling like an overflow shelf. I don't know if you typically store anything on here, but if you're entertaining a bunch of people, maybe you have an extra couple bags of chips or something like that, and you can store them down here where, assuming the sun's up high, the sun's not going to bake the goods, and it'll just, you know, be overflow storage. It's, it's a shelf. I'm trying to make it sound more important than what it is. It's just a shelf, and you do shelf things with a shelf. Another design element brought to you by Captain Obvious is the lid to conceal the cooler. This particular cooler is what I'm considering garden hose ready. So the drain, the drain cap, right, has the same threads as a garden hose. So you can screw a small section of, of drain or of, of hose right there for a drain if you want to. But if you just do a hose by itself, you don't have a way to restrict the flow. As water drains, it's going to continuously come out here unless you have some type of, of a valve. So uh, what I put on here is just a garden hose gooseneck that has an integrated ball valve on it. This allows me to put a small section of hose right here to drain it if I want to drain it. But also because of this enlarged opening right here and, and the fact that I don't have a permanent spigot mounted right here, which is very, very common in these cooler boxes, that allows me to actually take the cooler completely out. There's two reasons why I wanted to... Oh, I gotta put some oil on that hinge. There's two reasons why I wanted to be able to remove the cooler completely. First off is the drain itself is not quite at the bottom. So there's about an inch or so between the, the bottom of the drain and the bottom of the interior of the cooler. So basically, no matter what, this has to tilt in order to get all the water out. So I wanted to be able to remove the cooler easily, but also I want to be able to clean. Uh, I wanted to be able to clean this on the inside without it being permanently attached to this. So having the cooler easily removable checks both of those boxes. Set it down in place. Center it very easily with my fingers. Make sure it's all the way pulled forward, and then it aligns perfectly. This entire project is made out of three quarter inch plywood. So basically no matter where you want to mount stuff, it's, it's all solid. So you have a solid mounting location anywhere. You want to put some paper towels suspended from the top right here. You can make a bracket for paper towels or maybe vertically on the side or, or maybe this thing lives next to a grill and you want some extra hooks for grill attachments and accessories and whatnot. Either way, the side panels are a blank canvas for accessories. On to cutting the material. Now I used a CNC to cut all these uh, just because I'm going through the process of making this entire design and plans and all of that in the digital world first. It's not that big of a step once I've already got it done there to just switch it over to CNC and have the machine cut it. 
versus using typical traditional modern day power tools like a table saw and whatnot. So don't let that discourage you. There are some disadvantages of using a CNC. For example, I have to use tabs on my CNC machine to keep everything together because I don't have a vacuum table. That adds an extra process of not only cutting the tabs to release them from the machine or from the spoil board, but also I have to use a flush trim router bit to flush trim all of those tabs. So just because I'm using a CNC machine doesn't mean it's crazy fast or even sometimes the fastest route for the uh, project. It's just the, my preferred workflow. So understand that you can make this without question without a CNC machine. Optional decoration was next for me. So I knew that I wanted this particular design on the front of this. So for me, the solution was to put the front panel before assembly on the machine again, the CNC machine, and V-carve it out. So that carved out a, a physical subtractive process to get that particular design. Again, you don't have to have a CNC machine to get a design like that. Look around locally for in your Facebook marketplace or um, Craigslist or just ask people if you can find somebody who has a vinyl cutter odds are you can get them to cut something pretty darn cheap and you can put a nice decorative design like this on there with the vinyl. So it doesn't have to be a subtractive process where you're carving away. You can just simply add a sticker. So that's an option for you as well. Again, I cut this out and I wanted to have that color contrast there, white and this, this red color. So right then and there, I took the time to paint the carving itself white because I knew I was gonna roll some red over the top of it. I needed a little bit more dry time, so that's the time to paint the carving. Before assembly, there are two things that we need to tackle, and that's rounding over all of the edges. This is, uh, it's not Baltic birch plywood, but it's a decent grade of plywood that I picked out. Uh, regardless though, the top and bottom layers of the plywood are paper thin. They're so thin and brittle and they want to peel up or whatever. So you need to break all the edges so you don't accidentally peel that up down the road, but also because you're going to be interacting with this thing, you don't want sharp edges anyway. I used a 1 8 of an inch roundover, which is a roundover bit that I've become very fond of over the past year or two. And because it, it kind of allows you to maintain the the shape of the project right you're not you're not adding like a, a half inch round over which drastically changes the look of whatever you're you know cutting on uh, but you are eliminating all the sharp edges keeping the form that you've designed in the project and it just it has that nice crisp refined feel to it uh, the second thing is pocket holes there are a lot of pocket holes that need to be cut on the inside of all these pieces uh, and then also down below the bottom shelf is held in place with pocket holes. So those are kind of tricky to cut on the very inside of that opening. I used a pocket hole machine that's kind of large. So if your machine is smaller than mine or you have a jig that goes on a table or something like that, it's going to be way easier for you to accomplish this than it was for me. Before we jump into the assembly, a couple assembly notes. First off, there is a difference in the joinery used between the CNC version and the typical power tool version. On the power tools, I just made a 1 8 of an inch deep dado on the inside of both the front and back panels to attach these side panels. That 1 8 of an inch dado is purely there for alignment purposes. And then pocket hole screws are used to fully secure it. Pocket hole screws and glue. On the CNC version, I like to use shallow mortise and tenon joints. So that's what I used on my particular project. There's two mortise and tenon joints on each side panel to front and back panel connection. Again, those are only there for alignment purposes or locating purposes, not necessarily for strength by any means. Glue and screws whenever possible. I'm not sure how much of the B-roll I'm gonna show as I'm explaining this. Uh, but I used glue in every single joint. I may not have shown it, but every single joint has glue. And pocket hole screws is the primary source of the construction. On the lid, I did use just brad nails because I didn't want uh, these smaller pieces splitting with the pocket hole screws. Um, so, so there's that. Glue and screws whenever possible. Make sure the side panel, that side panel over there with the drain, make sure that is in the correct orientation. It's not perfectly centered vertically. It is perfectly centered horizontally, but it favors the top side. So make sure that it is in the correct orientation when you not only drill the pocket hole screws to attach it to the top, but also when you assemble it so that that opening is favoring the top side. 
For the assembly, we can finally start with the main case or box. Everything in woodworking is basically just a box. This is, again, basically just a box. And technically, we're, we're putting a box inside this box with the cooler. Uh, after the box is completed, secure the case to the top panel. It may be handy or helpful to use some clamps to hold everything together before driving all of the pocket hole screws. Next, we can insert the cooler from the bottom of the case. This is assembled upside down, so that way the bottom of the cooler and the bottom of the cooler cart is pointing up. And in this orientation, the top of the cooler should be perfectly flush with the top of the shelves or the top of the top panel for the rest of the assembly. Once the cooler is in place, the cooler supports can be added, and this is what's actually going to hold the cooler up when it's full of all kinds of ice and drinks. This is gonna be a little bit heavy, so there's a lot of braces right here. Next is the caster supports and lower shelf in whatever order you want. In my case, I could not put a pocket hole all the way into the corner of that opening, so I went ahead and did the caster supports first, but if your pocket hole machine or pocket hole jig is much smaller than mine, you can probably put another screw closer to that corner, which would require you to put the shelf on first, then the caster supports. Order of operations doesn't really matter too much there. A lot of my build time here in the shop is interrupted by my personal life, and I, I allow that to happen because I value personal life more than business life. We're here for a reason to live, not, not not here to work. You know what I'm saying? So I have a lot of breaks here in the shop and I kind of want to time all of my projects so that if I know a break is upcoming, I want to add a little bit of finish here and there if possible so that it dries while I'm out doing something else. So a lot of this project or during a lot of this project, I would stop and add a coat of paint here or there. And it's kind of out of order if you were just to build this start to finish. But for me, it makes sense. So. Here's the point where I added my first coat of paint. Finally, the casters are added. And like I said, these are two inch casters. The, the wheel itself is two inches. They add an overall height of two and three quarters of an inch. And that puts this shelf at 34 and three quarters of an inch off the ground. So if you want to add more height, bigger casters, obviously, and you can do the math there to determine what your overall height will be based upon the casters that you choose. Again, I had another break coming up, so another coat of paint. And then off camera, I built the lid assembly. So this lid right here is, again, a box. Everything is a box. And it's just a frame of butt joints for the plywood. And then this top piece just sits down on top of the entire thing. So this top panel, you can see the exposed plywood edges all the way around it. And then on the sides, you can see the exposed edges of the plywood for the front and back pieces. And the, in, the sides are you know nested in between. Anyway, a super basic design relying on the strength of glue, not any type of screws with the lid assembly and brad nails to kind of hold it together while the glue dries. I made sure to shoot the brad nails a little bit away from the edges because I did come back with that 1 8 of an inch round over bit and rounded over all of the edges of this top tray, box, lid, whatever you want to call it, everything's just a box. So with the lid done, we can do some lid prep. First, I scuffed the surface of the plastic lid to have a little bit more grip for whatever adhesive I was going to use. And for the adhesive, I used some leftover thick epoxy that I had. This is some Total Boat stuff. Uh, I think it's thick so. I'm not exactly sure what it was off the top of my head. Uh, but I used that, mixed it up by hand instead of using the applicator nozzle that comes with it. And it worked just fine. Uh, but to get everything secured, I put some heavy weight on top of the lid, uh, on top of the wood frame. And of course, this is freshly painted. So for the the joint between the lid and the case itself, or the, the top panel. Uh, I put some painter's tape down so it doesn't want to stick. And then also I put painter's tape on the bottom of these levels that I put down on top to help disperse all of the weight. So there's, that's the lid, very basic. After that, touch up the engraving paint. I was a little bit sloppy with the red, so I touched it up with a little bit more of the white. And finally, the hinge can be installed on the back. Two tips for installing one of these piano hinges. First, use a VIX bit, if you can get a hold of one of these. VIX bits are spring-loaded self-centering bits 
the, the exterior, the perimeter part of the spring-loaded assembly centers inside of the hole on the hinge, and then you can plunge a drill bit dead center of that hole. These VIX bits are crazy, crazy convenient when installing hinges. And the second tip is, is to use a screwdriver. These screws are so, so tiny that using a drill, even with a clutch set on the drill, even with a very good, you know, uh, very good uh, trigger finger, you're still likely to strip these out. So as, as tempting as a drill is to put these screws in, do yourself a favor and take the time to use a screwdriver. There's nothing more annoying. Well, there's a lot more annoying, but it's very, very annoying when you install a hinge on, on something and the only place the hinge can go is where you screw it down and you strip out the screws and you gotta fill them again with glue and toothpicks or something, real redrill the holes. It's very annoying. Use a screwdriver, save yourself the headache. Two things to mention as I wrap up this video. First is the cooler size. This is a 120 quart cooler. And I wanted a large cooler like this for two reasons. Number one, we host large gatherings frequently. So we have a lot of people here, a large cooler, a lot of people, it makes sense. Number two is it's not only just drinks that I wanna keep cold, even though it says ice cold drinks right on the front, you know, the potato salad and the other stuff that's cold that people eat can all go in here before anybody arrives. And then once people are here, everything is outside ready to be put out. And it, it, it eliminates a lot of unnecessary back and forth while you're trying to entertain a bunch of people going inside and outside to the refrigerator. Uh, I don't want an extra refrigerator outside on the back patio that's just unnecessary energy consumption because a lot of the times it won't be utilized to its maximum capacity. So anyway, refrigerators out of the question. So I wanted a large cooler. The second thing that I want to mention real quick is maybe there's a need for extra lid support for your situation. This I've opened and closed. I got to put some oil on that hinge. I've opened and closed it dozens and dozens of times. I don't see an issue with the strength here with the uh, piano hinge and whatnot, but I'm also not going to abuse it. And this will only be located in two positions on our back patio, in its storage location and then in its use location. Um, both of those have some type of material support on the backside. So up against a wall or a post, it's always gonna have something for this to, to rest up against uh, in use. So it's never going to be overextended. But if you have some little ones around who may not have the height to fully open it without smacking it up, they may, may get it to right here and then just have to push it all the way. At that point, I would recommend some type of chain at the very least. The easiest solution is to put a piece of chain from here to here on the inside, and that'll stop this from overextending, or maybe even one of them little corner brackets that you can add like a like a, um, what's it, what is it, blanket chest lid support, something like that that you can add to the outside here. I don't think it's going to be a problem in my situation, so I didn't add it, but I do think it's necessary to actually talk about it. You want to try it real quick? You want to try and open the lid? All right, my four-year-old is going to try it. Let's see how much you can open it without, uh... oh, it's heavy, huh? It is a little bit heavy. So you can't open it all the way, but you can open it with one hand and pretend to grab a drink from right here, right? So you can open it and grab an invisible drink. Can you do that? All right, so you're good to go. So, so there's that. Just something else to consider. You smiling because you're on camera? Cool, that's awesome. Uh, last thing to mention is my plans. I've got a set of plans, like I said, for this. I'm not a really good salesman, so if you want to buy them, cool. If you don't, that's cool too. Uh, that's it. Go to my website, jcustomcreations.com slash newsletter and sign up for my email newsletter so you don't miss anything that I publish. You guys take care. Have a great day. And I'll talk to you in the next video. You want to come say bye? No, you got to come here. You got to come here. What do you want to say? You got bashful all of a sudden. Yeah? You want to just wave bye-bye? You don't have to say anything. You can wave bye-bye. There you go. See you later. All right, it's hot. Dad, I have a friend and they watch your videos. You have a friend and they watch my videos? Okay. That's pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. But they... They used to go to the library, but that you don't know now. Yeah, they probably took a break for summer. What do you think? Yeah, let's go get some lunch.